Well, let's let's kind of get into stuff. So yeah, so you know, other than the nonsense we're just talking about, that is you know, in everybody's mind. But let's kind of talk about this subject because I think it'll be good for all of us. And it it is, um, I guess, training when you're older slash competing when you're older. And you can say whatever that means for you, right? Uh, meaning that uh, Gary and I are in our mid forties and ties in his uh, mid thirties, roughly. But everybody kind of feels that 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 um, that thing, I guess, whatever that is, that slow down when you get a certain age. It could be different for everybody, right? Like I know 60, 70 year olds that still train. You know, they all feel it. But um, and that's, that's kind of what I talk about. So like verse, like obviously when we're 18 and nowadays, you know, this is the unique thing that I have to go through, which, which Gary, you're probably the same, is that when I trained in the 90s, uh, specifically when I started in like 95, 96, 97, like there was no other jujitsu people, right? So like we we're the first kind of group of people starting. For example, I took seminars, you know, learn jujitsu from blue belts if there was, and it was very few and far between out of travel really far and you know it's it's kind of a laughable now because there's blue belts everywhere but i spent 50 or 75 dollars to take a seminar from a blue belt and it was unheard of like if you're a blue belt they're like oh my god you could beat mike tyson or floyd mayweather you know that's the kind of talk you still heard um which is fine but like now there's a blue belt on, on every corner and the what the, really the point i'm trying to make is that we've had a generation that started training when they're young, right? So these people are good when they're like 18, 19, um, you know, they don't have a job. They don't have, they have a time to train every day. They're, they're in shape. Um, they're just a lot better. Right. So as opposed, so, so the point is even like we have good athletes now that may still be white belts or blue belts, but, but you're coming in, but they may have wrestled their whole life or they may have done jujitsu their whole life. They're at a different caliber than the people that, that, maybe Gary and I uh, especially had came up with, right? Would, is that a fair assessment that, that you guys would say? I would definitely say for me that I feel that way. Like when I started in, in uh, I think uh, the, the talent level entering into a white belt division is so much stronger than what I experienced at white belt. It, I, it, for me, like if you were a white belt coming in and you were, had decent athleticism, uh, you had a good chance at standing on the podium. And now if you have decent athleticism, you, you still have to have some skill in order to make the podium. Uh, so yeah, definitely. I think the, definitely the, the bar has been raised and that's, I think that's just like anything, the more interest that something gathers, uh, the stronger the competition is going to be. Which, so, you know, that is a good thing, right? We're not, we're not saying it's a bad thing, but what that does is change the way that you, like I, I would not be able to train with these 18 year olds every single day because quite frankly, they recover faster, right? And they can go balls to the wall and uh, let alone if you have some guy comes in that's on some, you know, some illegal supplements or, or you know what I mean? Or, and then you're going through all that stuff. And then anyway, the, the point is they have every day to train and they have some stuff and, and maybe I train pretty hard nowadays, especially at 44. And uh, it might take me a day or two to come back to normal. Or, you know, maybe I could show up the next day, but my body just feels like crap, you know what I mean, or something, right? Um, and so that's kind of what I'm thinking. So just on training wise, I know me, I've had to kind of alter the way that I'm training. And just from personal experience, you know, to kind of get us into the middle of everything. I know that this year in particular has been a rough year. So like I started off with the pandemic, of course, we all did. And I was like, okay, well, that's cool. This is going to motivate me. This, this, tell, this took jujitsu away from me, took training away from me. And now I, I, I've reinvigorated, um, you know, thought process of how I miss jujitsu and how important it is to me. And that, that it's, so I'm, I'm going to give everything I got to training and do this and do that. And then literally every time I would get in a groove, I would get injured, right? So like I'd go, I'd, I'd rip my bicep early on. So then I'm out of training forever because I'm recovering from a torn bicep that I had to have surgery. Um, then I, you know, I get over that and I come back and not long after I get my eye split open pretty badly where I had to have, you know, multiple stitches by a plastic surgeon and had to go through all that stuff. And then I come back and then it, it's just, it, it compounds. It's like injuries come up from nowhere. You know what I mean? Like the same things that never bothered me before are just left and right, left and right. So then I'm like, okay, so, I can't be breaking down that easily. So what, what's the, what's the difference between now and you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 
and maybe it is just like we just said, maybe my recovery time in my body, like even though my mind feels the same, my body's actually obviously not the same. I, I can't recover and, and things are, are weak, right? Like when I tore my bicep, there's nothing that I did that was too crazy. I mean, I, honestly, I was like boxing and doing normal stuff and, and then just, just like literally, it's like not a good weightlifting story. There's nothing, nothing fancy. I threw a left hook, my bicep ripped off my arm. Um, you know, same thing, I shot a takedown, my eye got split open. I, you know, it's like, uh, like, there's more than that. But those are the two biggest ones that I can think of. So then I'm thinking like, so what do I need to do? Like, do I just, you know, I need to warm up more? Or do I need to like, you know, be easier? I still don't have the answer. I'm, I'm, I'm working through that, which is kind of why I wanted to talk to everybody. Maybe we come up with the answer together. Um, and then it also puts you in a weird headspace, right? I, I know that's what happens to me is that you, you start to get down on yourself because it's like we're all a little this i think we've talked about this before a lot of the guys that do jujitsu or do mma or do whatever we have our own kind of mental health issues or not even that it's not like i have a mental thing but you go through depression easy you go through other things easy so those are things kind of get you down that the training is what helps me be normal um and so anyway you're in a slump all the time so i'm still working through that myself this year has been awful for for what it started off i have literally hardly trained at all i feel like i've probably gotten 10 times worse than I was, you know, and, and that's me being hard on myself. I'm sure other people would say whatever, but, uh, you know, I don't have the answers. I, I'm, I'm searching for them. So, I mean, have you guys went through something similar this year or before? Or, I mean, do you have anything, you know, that compares to my terrible 2021 or whatever year we're in? <laughs> like, it's not been so good so far, you know? Well, I mean, uh, to just kind of touch on what, what you were first uh, talking about, about um, how, the technique and the skill level, the pool is just so much deeper now because these kids are starting at six, you know, and by the time they get into a blue belt division, they're going to smash you. But, uh, you know, uh, you started, what, what year did you start, Butch? Uh, I would say 97 would probably be a safe, I'd probably start a little bit before that, but 97 is the best. So 97, I started uh, somewhere like 08, 09, so 10, a little more than 10 year difference. Uh, unfortunately for me, because of what Vegas is, Vegas is pretty much the Mecca of MMA. You know, there, there were already skilled people here. So to podium here was ridiculously hard. Now, uh, I mean, I made podium every time I competed, but it wasn't easy. It, nothing close to even the word of easy. Like I would prep, I would sign up for a tournament and it'd be three months before and I would just completely not do anything else and just get ready for this tournament. And that's how I made podium. Now, I didn't get, I didn't get first place all the time, but my goal was to get podium, which I did the times that I, that I, uh, that I competed. But uh, uh, in the process, I destroyed my body. So I started wrestling in high school. So I've been grappling for a long time and I competed a lot in wrestling. So that already destroyed whatever I had in, in the, in the youth years, but in the very beginning, in the teens and in the early 20s, it was easy to recover. Like I would mess up my neck or mess something up to my knee. And literally the next day, I'd be good to go. Train hard. Try to kill each other. Yeah. And then um, I, I coached wrestling for a while. And then I found jujitsu when I was 21. And then since I was 21, I was in between the, you know, college time and trying to find a career time. So I could work part time and live at home and try to do jujitsu and make something out of it. So I was training twice a day, Monday through Friday, once on Saturday and an open mat on Sunday. So I was training 12 times a week and I was doing that for months and months and maybe, maybe, maybe about a year and a half, honestly. And that took a toll because during that whole time I would compete. So I would train extremely hard to, to just be able to make podium and, and to compete. And then by the time I was yeah, so it was about a year, year and a half. I was like 22, almost 23. I uh, hurt my back really bad. And um, after I hurt my back, I couldn't train as much. Um, literally, I was limited to maybe two, three times a week that I could do from the 12 times I was doing a week. And uh, it took a real toll on me. And I had to, I had the rest. I couldn't really compete because I'm not going to compete at 50%. You know, I, I need to be at least 80% to compete. You know, you're never 100% doing what you get to just doesn't work yeah. but uh i would i would always i would always think about competing again but then i kind of just gave up on the idea because nothing heals the way that it does anymore 
So I'm 33 now. I'm not, I'm not that old. 33 is relatively young, but in grappling years, I've destroyed myself over the years. So for me to, for me to get the itch to, to compete, it, you know, there'd have to be a pretty big motivation for me to go back and do that. As of right now, I'm just not doing it because I can't train that much. I can train literally once, maybe before I start getting pain. Like I can get one good training session and go really hard and that'll be it for that week. Or I can do two moderate, you know, and then maybe I can get in a day of just timing and trying to get my technique in or something like that. I mean, I'm still on top of my game, but I just can't train as much because now I have this everlasting injury that I don't know is ever going to go away. And all the other regular injuries, just like tweaking your neck or maybe your elf or something that, that doesn't, that doesn't heal correctly because I don't know, age, grappling age, I guess, I guess I could say. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, so let's do So, um, I didn't mess it up. How, um, well, here's what I want to ask. So just for people that don't know, tell Todd, just before we go to, to Gary and have him, him, and hopefully I just was looking at this screen. So if I mess this up, guys, I apologize. I might've had Gary pinned this whole time. So you might've been talking and Gary's face was on there. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was a little rough. It's okay. No problem with that. That's all right. We'll just, uh, we'll pretend next time uh, Gary can lip sync uh, and it'll all work out. But um, tell, tell people your background a little bit. So obviously um, like we said you're in Vegas now. Um, tell them what your belt level is, your lineage and some step just for, for reference thing. And then Gary, you'll do the same when we go up to you and then, you know, just. Okay. So, uh, I I'm in Vegas. I started with, uh, Gracie Maita. I was pretty much white to black all the way through. Um, it, it got a little political. So I left, uh, got my first degree under Butch and, uh, a lot better experience now <laughs> it's it's a lot different because before it was a uh, almost like a, a kind of a dark curtain every time you walk through the door because all the politics and whatnot but uh i mean that that's a whole another story that uh, <laughs> well, yeah, be. And, and like just yeah we're not bad like all of us have been through the same situation in a certain degree right like um I came with uh, hoist gracie and uh, the same thing i'm not going through all of us have made some changes or moves uh, gary included doesn't mean we don't like the people we were with it's just that at some point you found you just need to do something that was kind of a little bit better for your situation right so uh, yeah so we're like that's the other thing like let's make sure we're not bashing anybody we're like and i'm sure for you you're incredibly grateful for the training and the opportunities that you had um just ultimately that you had to make a change for for certain reasons it doesn't even matter why right it just it it changed and doesn't mean you don't like the people you don't like the situation uh, you can not like situation but you know man things change um we grow and we grow differently and sometimes we grow apart just like relationships right it, that you grow apart and you, you find like that's not the place for you anymore it doesn't mean those people aren't good or you're not good you just kind of grew apart right i assume just to put it in a nice way no absolutely absolutely you're 100 percent correct yeah so so and, and again i just wanted that for context because you're a guy like you said you've been wrestling your whole your life you're a black belt uh you have a school in vegas you've been training um and the reason that's important is right like i think there's there's a lot of weight in what's in the experience that we've had in the places we've been and and i want to make sure that people have context for that because I, sometimes i take it for granted that everybody that uh, that listens to this they know who we are obviously and they don't uh, there's going to be people that tune in and they don't know who we are um so anyway gary um do the same thing where they go ahead and introduce yourself and then say you can say the same something similar um through the through the process that you've been through or what you're experiencing now with your training and as you get older yeah so uh, as far as background and stuff i started under a health in a health and gracie school and like you said you know relationships change it's no different than you know two people who grow apart uh, it was time for, for me to do other things. I still love everybody that I originally trained with, but started my own place. I was in limbo for a while. And then, uh, you know, I'd known you pretty much the entire time I'd done jujitsu, I'd done WVGOs and you were, you are kind enough to take me on. Um, as far as competing, I, uh, I, I had a pretty good run. I, now I started jujitsu when I was 31. And so I was a little bit older, you know, you guys, uh, we're in your twenties. I was basically, I, I was a dad, I was married and, 
I had a, a nine-year-old daughter. So I was, I was already doing the family thing. Uh, compete, uh, I got into jujitsu, loved the competition, uh, started competing, did really good at white belt. Uh, by the time I got blue, I was, I was, it was a year in, I got blue belt and I hit a bit of a, a slowdown and I didn't realize the transition from white belt to blue belt was going to be so hard competitively. Uh, so that was kind of a, a nice punch in the face. But after I, I kind of settled into blue belt, did great through blue belt, purple belt, ended up st- winning some like state championships and stuff. I uh, was able to go to world masters and I was 30, 30, 36 when I went to world masters. Um, had, had a rough first match where I lost, but I was the only guy that scored points on the guy who ended up winning the division. He beat me. And so it was one and done at IBJJF, but I was the only, I, I actually, I, I came close to beating him and then he ended up winning the division. So I could have podiumed if I was on the other side, possibly, but that's ifs, ands, and buts. Um, but as far as competition goes, I kind of, I kind of enjoyed teaching. And so the more I taught, the less interest I had in competing. And uh, I don't know, I, as far as uh, competing in the adult division, because it, it kind of felt weird competing in master's divisions because I'd done so good in just adult divisions, even though I was master's age. And I, uh, I got to the point where there was like, what, what else is there to prove to compete locally? You know, uh, I'd, I'd already won state, cha- uh, state titles and, and all the local promotions and I'd been on fight to win and so there wasn't a lot for me to do locally anymore. And I kind of lost the, the interest one time with the family to go and travel and do a lot of IBJJFs if I wanted to compete nationally or whatever. Um, and I, I wasn't ready to, to give all that time away, but two, I definitely felt 37, 38. Uh, I could feel like I, I, I'd lost a step and I, you know, I, I, guys who were training the same time, the same amount of time as me, who started when they were 19 or 18 still had all the speed that they had when they were 18 and I have all the knowledge that I have. And it's hard to keep up. And I definitely felt like I'd lost a step. Um, so it, that kind of pushed me away from competing in the local promotions. And not only that, it's hard to get, uh, uh, you know, a division of Brown belt master 40 year olds it just doesn't happen that often. So uh, I'm going to, if I'm going to compete about Brown belt locally, I have to compete with, brown belt adult division well let's be honest like even naga uh, assumes they usually don't they still do like purple and above so it's purple brown black right and for the nogi i believe yeah well i think they do that gi too because that's because there's not well you're in vegas right so it's a little bit different like you probably guys have enough but here um yeah they do a gi too and so like for the browns and blacks there's like nothing there's nothing to win right like it's it puts you in a in a difficult situation like i know people will argue like who cares if you're black belt you should win right but but you don't and so how many times like i would be on instagram or facebook and they'd be like so and so is a purple and he won the black belt division and it's a it's a big deal right and everybody's talking about it well how do you think all those black belts and brown belts felt like they're like well that's stupid i didn't have nothing to win you know i mean they weren't as amped up as the purple belt probably maybe they were i don't i don't know i just know as a guy that throws tournaments and I look at that, like, I get it. Like I used to not like before I threw tournaments, I'd be like, yeah, just go in there and do it. You know, like, what do you got to lose? And then as I saw it, I just saw the, the difference, the elation of the purple belt versus the, the down of the brown or black where they're like, I had nothing to gain from this match and this guy beat me. And now I feel like dog shit. And he feels like, you know what I mean? It's all over Instagram. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a rough one too, which shies a lot of people away from those tournaments, meaning like the Browns blacks are like, I'm not going to go and possibly lose to a purple, you know, that it, it just should happen. Right? You know what I mean? And I get it where somebody could argue and say, well, that's stupid. You know, they're stupid. I understand both sides of the argument. I get it. Totally get it. Yeah. yeah I think it puts the unnecessary level of stress on the blacks and Browns. If you're going to throw a purple belt in there, because that's something that's going to be in the back of their head that they're going to be thinking about. I, I do agree with, yeah, if you're good, you're good. It makes sense, but it, it is at some extent or some level embarrassing to lose to lower belts. I mean, that's just the nature of what, you know, we have belt colors for a reason, you know, yeah. and a lot of people will take that, that belt to heart, especially when they've worked, uh, you know, 10 plus years to get their black belt. They're not maybe as athletically inclined as this purple belt who gets to train eight hours a day and eat good food and be sponsored and whatnot. 
and they get beat. Of course, you're going to get beat. You're you're X amount of years old. You took 10 plus years to get your black belt. You you didn't have all this time to prepare for this tournament. You know, you maybe had some time, but like, you know, like Gary, he had a family when he first started. It's like, you don't, you got to go home and you got to be daddy. You got to have time for the family. You don't have time to just train for eight hours, you know, and eat all the good stuff because you, you can't sit there and prep your meals because you have to be daddy. You have to be husband. You have to, you know, do whatever it is. So at a, at a certain level, when it comes to mixing them up, I can understand why they do that, especially, you know, at different parts of, of the country. I can understand why they mix them like that. Uh, I can understand why people will be upset about that, but it is what it is. And this is the nature of what you get to is at this point. Yeah, well, and and they tend to be uh, mostly, you know, if it's purple and up, uh, they tend to be mostly purples, right? Like every now and then. And that's the other thing. Like there's some guys, um, everybody's got a different thing. Because so, I hear a lot of people, they say, well, I compete for fun. And it's okay for them. They don't mind losing, right? If they lost to a purple belt, they're like, ah, you know it's okay but they're they're fine like emotionally they're okay because they know the things that you just said like they're like well i just didn't you know i don't i don't have a lot of time to train it is what it is they're emotionally fine with it and they don't care what other people say right but most people are not emotionally fine with it right because they're like they, you know maybe they have a school they, they they run in a gym and they're like well i don't want somebody to say like trash me and say this purple belt beat me in this thing he's not a real black belt or whatever it, it doesn't matter so then at that point the other people are saying those excuses don't matter. Like they're like, well, you, it doesn't matter if you didn't have time to train. You're a black belt, right? Like, it, you know, all this stuff. So it makes it difficult um, on those things, you know, and really, and that's what like one of the things you said, Gary, too, that I, I wanted to make sure that we covered too is, is really just time, right? As you get older is, is, is those things. Like the difference between high level competitors and not really high level competitors usually is time on the mat, for example. Um, meaning that uh, let's bring like a Gordon Ryan or all the Donaher guys. I'm assuming they train every day. I think we all agree. I think they've said they train every day. Now, rather they do or don't, they, that's what they say. Some of them probably two days a week, right? And that's why they're elite competitors. So realistically, somebody that trains three times a week, you know, that's what I could train if I'm pushing it. And really, even if I said I train three days a week, that might be 20 minutes one of those days and maybe another an hour another one of those you know i mean it doesn't mean it's the quality of training that maybe those guys are getting with other elite black belts and doing other stuff right because they have got people traveling to them so anyway like there's that level so for me for example like i think i think probably around purple belt somewhere in that region that's about when i stopped competing now, I also want to be like, I'll be honest, like when I started, you guys, like I said, it was in the 90s. There wasn't these, there, I don't, there wasn't an IBJJF at that time. There was, I think they, they had pans, you know, that Pan Am thing. And then, and that was like a thing that some people did. But it's, again, it was like not, like a, not a ton of people, you know. But anyway, like, so the only thing there was was like uh, local tournaments. And then later around that time when I was blue purple, I think Naga and Grappler's Quest started to come around, but they also weren't like they are now. Like they're not in every f place. Like it would be like Grappler's Quest or Naga in New York and people would travel to there or like a big city, right? So there wasn't a ton of that. And I did, you know, and for my sake, I did what I could do at the time. And, and I, I make it clear that there's a lot of stuff that, you know, competition wise, I, I just didn't do that. I wish I did, but then it came to like, you know, my instructor now, Marcelo Montiero, like that's what he'll say, hey man, just compete for fun. And cause he, you know, he, he pushes, he's competed his whole life, he pushes it. And that's what I tell him, I said, well, Marcelo, for me, like it's not fun to lose, you know, like for, for me, like competing also goes along with winning. That's the fun part. And I was like, so what, what would happen to me is if I went to a competition, let's say IBJJF Worlds and I did Masters Black Belt or whatever, and I lost, I would be obsessed with that because I, I boxed, I did all this other stuff. And I know what my attitude was. Like, for example, when I boxed, I used to have my wife at the time, like we'd be driving down the road and I'd tell her pull over just because inside my head, I would think the other guy's training. So I'd like pull over and she'd be like, why? And I was like, because I'm going to run home from here. And I would run home and I would train all the day. I was like obsessed, right? Because I'm like, I don't want this other guy to outwork me. So what would happen is if I would did a competition for fun and I lost, then I would say, okay, I need to train more, which is the right answer. So, and because that means I'm going to give up other things in my life, whether that's family time or that's work time, it's other than things like it, you know, I, I allocate, like I'm pretty spread thin. I've got four or five jobs at work, like literally I have four or five jobs and that's not a joke and run, uh, run my academy and do other stuff. I'm, 
and we're obviously we're on this podcast and do a bunch of stuff that I'm I'm spread pretty thin on, but um that that's that is my thing right now and it's the same thing with with the training i'm like hey man like that's why i can't do those things i know where i'm at um you know what what limitations i have and all those things and so therefore you know that's my theory on on the thing like it i don't have the time to put forth through those things which is almost the same thing like i have to come to a grips with my reality at 44 is like i can only train a couple days a week um you know, so what, what is the reality of that situation? I'm not going to be as good as I want to be, right? Or, you know, that, that I hope that I could be, that I want to be. Um, and it sucks. And then because of that, maybe because I'm only training two days a week, and then I come in and I go, you know, hard like I used to, then also my body falls apart, right? It's, it's hard to grab, to come to grips with all these things, which is obviously one of the things we're talking about. But um, anyway, that's my current situation. Right. This is, that's what I think of when I go through that. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have, I mean, what do you guys think similarly uh, as opposed to or, or similar to what I'm thinking there? For me, <laughs> I'm probably, this is 100% probably a midlife crisis. <laughs> yeah. right? Like I, I feel, I feel the age happening and I see my kids growing up and I've got a daughter who's about to start driving and my son is, you know, he's, he's doing jujitsu too. And, and so it's kind of like, I, you know, I kind of want one more hurrah. Yeah. So, because it, I know that I'm going to settle into teaching coaching and I'm happy with that, but I also don't want to leave. I don't want to leave this opportunity either. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So that's a good point. So then on that point, are you, so I know you've thought about this. So are you, what are you giving up to, to make your last hurrah? Like, are you, like okay i'm gonna spend less time with my wife and kid or like what are you taking away i, I actually I, that was something that i talked with my wife about a couple of weeks ago is that you know i i, I needed her to say it was okay yeah. yeah and that she would follow me like and i told her i was like if i'm doing this i need to do a couple of local competitions if that goes good i need to do maybe go to orlando and do an ibjjf or to new york and do an ibjjf Hopefully they'll come back to Cincinnati soon and when everything opens up. But, and then if I can do good there, I know I can go to Vegas and try my, try my hand at worlds. Um, but it's going to take time and, and money and, and time, time from work and I, I, all the sacrifices that everybody has to make. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not short selling anybody else's sacrifice, but that's, you know, my time with my kids is, is important. You know, it's, it's part of the reason I'm still doing jujitsu as, as passionately as I am is because my son does it with me. So um, all of that stuff plays in. We're, I would argue, not to cut you off, I'm, I apologize, but I'd argue too, you're giving up, you're almost giving up greater sacrifice because let's be honest, we're not getting paid to do this. You're paying to do this. You're paying your travel, you're paying your entry fee. All you're getting is a medal, right? It's important, like, don't get me wrong, but there's a big difference between the three of us talking about this and Gordon Ryan and all the people that we all watch, they're getting paid to do that. So they're making certain sacrifices, but that is essentially their job. Like our job is not this, right? It is kind of because we own academies, but not really, you know what I mean? It's a different thing, totally. Yeah, yeah, I, de I definitely agree. Yeah, I, I uh, but, you know, and that's that's the weird thing is, is it's, it's not like, not that there's anything wrong with golf, right? <laughs> but like we're we're in a we're in a sport where at some level I'm I'm running up against or running into regularly people who are the best in the sport. And, and you can't play basketball and play with LeBron James. And you can't the, the possibility for you to run into a guy who's gonna be the greatest ever it happens all the time. You've had him at WVGOs where I mean, Gordon Ryan, you, Gordon Ryan, you've coached his ma uh, one of his matches and Tom DeBlas was there. So, so like all of that happens and doesn't happen anywhere else. And so it's nice to know that like, I get to see it firsthand what the level is. Maybe there's a chance that I get to, to roll with somebody who, who becomes something great. Well, no, and that's a good point. Like we've, we've brought that up before too, is that I know obviously you and I have talked about, it, but I mean, in, in Ty, so, you know, so we run these local tournaments. I've had everybody from Jeff Monson, Tom DeBlas, Gordon Ryan, Nikki Ryan, uh, Gary Tone, and 
on and on and on. Like, you know what I mean? Like literally on and on, like Ricardo Almeida, um, you know, like the, the best of Dante uh, Rivera, all these crazy, crazy good people compete, right? And here's the crazy thing is some, most of the time, not even some of the time, most of the time, these local guys almost win. And sometimes they actually have one. Um, I don't even want to mention names because those I'm, I'm blessed that those people came here. So I don't want to say anything like hey, so-and-so lost or did this or that. But there is definitely a handful of times that these elite world level grapplers lost to somebody from West Virginia or Ohio. And I would argue from, it goes back to what we said at the beginning. I would argue that that happened almost because they didn't have nothing to win. They're like, I'm going to beat this guy from West Virginia. I've never heard of this guy. He's nobody. He's from a place that has no jujitsu. This shouldn't be a, a hard thing. And then next thing you know, he's he's in a, a Kimura or something, you know what I'm saying? Or, or a leg lock or something, you know what I mean? So uh, anyway, for one thing, we're blessed that that has happened. But and another thing, it's, it's craziness. We've had, we've had some good opportunities. And to kind of go on, go back to that, like I call it the Tom Brady effect or the New England Patriots effect is like, if you're Gordon Ryan, you don't get anybody's B game. You get everybody's A game. And it's, it, I feel the same way. Like if I go to another Academy to train, like I've got some friends in Columbus who occasionally I've, I've gone up there and trained, even when, you know, we're affiliates, but even when I come down to Charleston, I feel it. Like everybody wants to get my head. Yeah. And, and, and so you're getting everybody's best round. You don't get rest rounds when it's, it's you're out of town or you're the, you're the top dog. Tom Brady doesn't get an easy game when he plays. Everybody wants to sack him and, and be the guy who took Tom Brady out of the game. And so th those guys, I don't know, Ty, you feel that way? Well, yeah, absolutely all the time. Anytime I drop into some, somebody else's place, it's like, yeah, you're going to have a target on your back, especially when you, when you go in as a higher belt, like if, as soon as you're purple belt and you show up somewhere else, that's it. They're coming after you, you know, uh, blue belt. They're like, okay, some kind of blue belt, no problem. You know, but at, purple belt is when you get noticed. And especially if you're dropping in, they're going to test you. They want to find out if they're good enough from whatever school you're coming from, you know? And uh, yeah, every time I drop in, I'm, I'm the one getting tested. And yes, that's all I get is hard rounds. I don't get easy rounds with anybody because everybody's coming after you. Not because of that only, but because, I'm a hundred and well, right now I'm like 155 pounds. I'm a smaller person. So people are going to want to smash me. Now I don't let it happen, but I'm going to get it. It's, it's a pretty normal thing for that to happen whenever I drop in anywhere. And anybody that I meet, like if I meet somebody that's a friend of a friend, like, Hey, is it cool if I drop by and roll around with you? Like, sure. And you know, 100% of the time after we roll, they would look at me like, yeah, I was, I was actually coming here to try and test you. Like I wanted to see how good you actually were. That's 100% of the time. Every single time I've had somebody come over to my place to roll because they ask me, hey, can I drop by your place to train? They're like, you know. Yeah. Pretty normal. But, and, now, and now compound that with being aging, right? And so now you're 40, 45, 50. They still come in and they want to beat the black belt. You, you're a black belt forever, right? Like they're, no one's taking that black belt. for. So you're a black belt forever. You're going to get that same attitude at 50 when they, they come in and roll and so th that's kind of like that's how we have to like for me I have to watch uh for my students like new people who come in I, I my thing is is like I, I if there's a new guy that starts I want him to roll with me for his first roll that way I know where he's at and if he's fast the crazy guy I just want to gas him I want to burn him up that way he's not going to hurt my guys um when he rolls and so but you know as we age I'm 40 now. I imagine that when I'm 50, that the guys who are new that really want to come after me are still going to come after me the same way. And Absolutely. I'm older. Yeah. You know, for, for that matter, I know we're talking about age and stuff, but for that matter, even the females in my, my uh, gym, if they have a blue belt on or a purple belt, those new guys come right after them. They don't care that they're a girl. And, and quite honestly, you know, sometimes it's a like, you know, these girls are, maybe 150 pounds, probably not even half the time. And then this guy could be a wrestler, high school wrestler. You know what I mean? They're just going after him. And it's, it, they could beat them. You know what I mean? Because it's, it's not that they're not technical. It's just that they're going ape shit. They're taking elbows. And these girls are not trying to be fighters, right? They're not, they're not used to the, 
you know, the punishment of their face and all, you know, the other stuff that we like when, when Gary says a spaz, that just, that means we're going to take some elbows and some knees, right? I'm used to it. Um, don't mean I like it. I just know it's coming, but there's a lot of people that can't take that. Like, a, you know, like I have a big thing too. Like when I roll and somebody knees me, or elbows me, even like I said, when my, my eye got split open, I do not stop ever because it's like, it's a dumb old rule, but I always, it's something, you know, I grew up with, you know, trained with hoist and, and they did, you know, no holds barred and stuff, but it was the thing, like, you don't, like, what are you going to do in the street? You're going to say time out. You punched me in the face. You hit me in the elbow. He's like, you got to get used to it. You got to get used to the contact. So I don't, that's how I am. But the way I am, is not the same. I've seen people get hit with some elbows that I think aren't even that bad. And I'm seeing them lay on the ground shaking, almost like, you know, how we make fun of, uh, not we, but people make fun of pro soccer players where they, it's, you know, they make, the, they're trying to get a foul called where they get touched and they fall over and flop and do it. I literally see that at my gym sometimes. And I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> like, I would not even have mentioned that thing, you know, but the point is those girls that are at those ranks that um, for the most part, they're not used to that contact. Right. And, um, and, but, you know, so the, the, it's a good, like, I, I see what you're saying with, with going with the spazzes, Gary, it's a good ideal. And, it's just so wild, all the things that we have to deal with. So I, I guess, you know, to, to bring this in around in a circle. So what, what adjustments are we all trying to make? Because I will be honest with you, I don't know yet. This is kind of why I was, I was looking forward to this podcast. I'm trying to figure it out. I'm in a little bit of a slump right now. One is because I told you, I, every time I get in a groove, I get injured right now. So I'm in a little bit of a, I'm not like walking around depressed or anything, but it's like when I get to the gym, it's, it's, I don't have that same enthusiasm that i had because it's just like i just uh just in a, a weird headspace so what adjustments are you guys making i know what and i have some good ideals but even the ideals don't make my brain happy the ideals that i would have would be like okay i'll pick certain training partners that do this but that makes my brain say secretly that you're a pussy right so i don't i'm not happy with that so i'm not like no i'm not going to do that i need to roll with everybody even if i'm not feeling it you know if i know if you know it's like i'm just not in a good spot right in this particular moment and i'm you know i'm coming off all these injuries so what do you, what's your guys' thoughts or what what are you doing to combat this or are you just grinding it out so my thing is uh because right now my uh, my understudies i have two very very good purple belts one's a one's a male he's a beer guy he's a he's a police officer he's Probably about 250, 260, but not fat 250, 260. He's, he's, he's pretty buff. Yes. And then uh, I got a female, yeah, who's, uh, she's about 170, a uh, taller girl, and she does very well. And she's actually the gatekeeper. So for me, it's, uh, I, I don't, it's not like I'm giving them the responsibility, but they have taken on the responsibility of taking care of business when we get new guys that come in that want to smash. Yeah. Because normally, my 170 pound female understudy, beats everybody that comes through the door just everybody so as long as you knew you know blue What's bells girl bells come through she can leave she was actually uh she was on the last zoom meeting when you gave me my promotion that's what i figured that's why i wanted to mention her name she she's a badass with uh she had the shorter hair yeah. correct yeah she's a badass correct yeah so that's so awesome. uh my thing Not was sure. that because 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 of my because of my injury, I can't go that hard. I mean, I do. I have. I was in the same place as you, Butch. Like wanting to always take care of business, always be that guy to you know protect the house. I guess <laughs> if you want to say that. But uh, for me, it's like uh, my understudies have taken up the responsibility themselves of being the gatekeeper and taking care of business because they know that I can't roll as hard and as many days as I want to. Like I can take care of business if I have to. Like if if they're training and they're being the gatekeeper and somebody comes through and let's say they're they're getting smashed on by this person, yes, then it's it's my turn to you know do what I need to do. But for the most part, it's up to them. Uh, Gary, I don't I don't know uh, how many students and what your highest belt under you is. So I've got I've got some guys who trained with me before at the other academy that I was at um, when I when I came back to Athens. They came or to the Athens area. They came back to me. Um, and they're kind of the reason that I came back to Athens County. Um, so I have uh, two purple belts, uh, and a, a blue belt under me, right? A couple blue belts under me right now, but it's still a small school. So right now, as it is, those guys are, they, they would do a good job enforcing, but uh, I, I still roll with everybody. And, and the school is small enough where um, just on a regular day, 
everybody, er, like everybody needs to roll anyway, just to get different looks. So um, hopefully in the future, <laughs> I've got some more people and, and I'm, you know, for the, I've got guys who help out occasionally, but I run all the classes. So that's the other thing too, is I'm I, like six days a week, I'm running classes or uh, with the exception of the striking class, I'm, but I'm there for the striking class and I'm trying to take my lumps there too. So that's where I'm at. Cause I'm kind of, I feel, I almost feel obligated to be the like leader and gatekeeper and all in one right now. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was, it was like, it was trusting them because they did take up the responsibility of being that gatekeeper, whatever it was. I never put it on them. Not at all. They just decided they wanted to, take up the role and do it so i mean that was a good thing for me so i didn't really have to think too much about it well and, and part of it too it's not that they couldn't do it i'm, mi I'm probably micromanaging a little bit as well like i want i like i want my hand in all the pots and so that that could be it as well it's 100 i'm still cutting my teeth as a coach so i'm still trying to figure out my side of it as far as like what to ask or what to expect or or how to let loose let go which is, that's a good point too, right? Because we all have different teaching styles. So none of them are, we're going to say, are right or wrong, right? I mean, it's the same. I'm, I'm in different positions at, at my gym is, you know, we've got brown belts, black belts, all that stuff, you know what I mean? So it doesn't, I don't even think about a gatekeeper per, per se, you know what I mean? Like, it's like somebody comes in, I'm like, well, there's like a murderer's row of people stuff you know i'm like i just think i'm like i don't even think of it that way i'm just like well good luck you know like all these guys are pretty tough you know which is a good thing but but i i've been with everything that you guys said right it's um i had you know around that same time the 90s 2000s i had some girls that are blue belts um that i put with everybody first and my thought process at that time was I wanted to show them how effective jujitsu was. So if I walked in off the street and I was, you know, 200 pounds and some little tiny girl beat me, I'd be like, man, I want to learn that stuff. Right. And that didn't always work out. I had a lot of people actually quit because they were embarrassed that a girl beat them. Right. And so I don't know, like looking at you know, I changed things since then. And, but looking back, I still don't know if that was right or wrong. Cause maybe those people had never, like I, we didn't need those people. Right. I, I don't know if that was too damaging to their ego or if those people wouldn't have came anyway. Right. Cause I, I still like, cause we'll still have people that come in out of the street and they'll get tapped and they slap the mat really hard and cuss and say, fuck, I can't, you know, I'm like, like if you came in and were beating everybody, like, why would you pay to be here? And people are like, well, that's a good point. I'm like, well, yeah, like, I don't understand what you're thinking. Like, I don't, I don't worry, but I also don't understand people's point. You're right? Cause I, at that same, I, I just don't understand people. They're all different. Right? Like I get phone calls every day where somebody calls me and they say, Hey man, I, I think I want to make a career out of this fighting thing. I'm going to be awesome. Um, I'm 300 and 0 in street fights. I, I you know, I want to come to your gym and show you what I got. And they come down and get murdered by everybody. People that aren't even good. And they, do, they never come back because it's too much for their ego. They, literally, this happens all the time. And it's not, I'm not trying to embarrass people, but at the same time, I usually make a joke about it now. Like when people say, hey, I'm 300 and 0 in street fights, I'm like, you must be an asshole because I've never been in that many fights. Like, you, how, how, is, how is this happening? Like, where are you finding all these people, especially in West Virginia? It's not like we walk out and find they're, people. They're <laughs> 300, 300 and 0 against their younger brother and wife. So. Yeah, that's, and it's funny, but it, at the same same thing, like if I were going to call a jiu-jitsu school, I talk myself down a hundred times. Like, uh, you know, I've traveled to several schools in the last few years um, when, when I was traveling with my job. And I like I went to Gracie Baja and uh, Dallas, Texas and American Top Team in Florida several times and several other gyms. But it's the complete opposite. Like I like to just go in and not make a like a scene and say nothing unless I'm asked, you know, like sometimes they'll say, what belt are you? And because the other re reason I'm worried about it, because like, for example, like at American Top Team, that particular place, one of the guys hated Marcelo Montiero, right? So I was like, oh, great. Like, this is gonna be great. So I tried to keep it quiet. Like, I didn't, you know, I already heard of it ahead of time. So like, that was the same thing. I didn't say nothing. I just went in and just rolled. And I think we we're rolling no gi. Usually I don't carry my gi anyway. So if I, if I win, I'd borrow a gi and didn't have a belt. And we just, I would just roll. And then they would see like little belt. Cause I, usually in my experience, what happens to me when I go to gyms, they'll throw like a blue belt at me, see what happens. Then they throw a purple belt at me. And then, I'll, then they'll 
like the instructor will come over and roll with me, or, you know, something, some, same kind of thing. But the whole time, like, I'm just like, I'm trying to roll as light and respectful as possible and not cause a, a scene. And, and then when it comes down to like, when they're finally like, well, what belt are you? And I'm like, well, I'm, you know, I'm a black belt, but I don't like compete a lot. I'm not trying to, I'm just here to have fun and, and try to learn from you. And, you know, I'm just make it no, totally known that I'm thankful to be there. I'm not like, hey, I'm 300 no mf -er, let's go. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, so why do you do that when you have no skill? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like I go in and have skill and, and I don't want to, I don't want to cause a scene. I don't want nobody just to, to like, you know, cause it also like you guys said earlier, like it's fine, but I don't want to walk into school and then have everybody in that room. And cause quite frankly, they're always big cities like Utah, like going to Vegas, like there's 50, 60 people. I ain't got the energy to fight 50 or 60 people today. I just wanted to come work out. Right. I want, want everybody to come try to kill me. Um, so we'll go anyway, you know I mean? That's my thought process, but you know, those the same thing. It, it's just, it's wild how vastly different that the people are and the things that we have to go through. And um, anyway, yeah. So, I, I mean, like you said, you, we got the time thing and, and time versus work and all this stuff. I mean, how, how are you guys, let me ask you this, Ty, I guess real quick, because I've been thinking about it. Do you have a herniated disc in your back or like what's going on on that side? Do you know? You just, your back's just hurting? It, yeah, it's messed up, and uh, I got in a car crash about three weeks ago. I got T-bone, so that didn't help it any better. No. So, I, yeah, I still need to get an MRI on Wednesday and figure out what exactly is going on in there. But uh, right yeah, now you – know, Like, if, if you got an MRI, this is – so we have a doc, a couple of doctors that work out with us, and this is a, um, a, a something he asked me once, because I do MRI on the side, you know, and I can take people, get them an MRI every anytime, and I've done it before. I say, hey, man, there's something wrong with you. Let's, let's shoot an MRI. There's something wrong with you. Let's get you hooked with a doctor so you can get, you know, ACL surgery or whatever. You know, right? Like, and then he told me he's like, "Well, I don't want to know because then I'd have to worry about it. I'll have to fix it." It's like if I don't know, I don't have to think about it. So I was like, in a weird, like at first I was like, well, "That's stupid." Then I started thinking about it. I was, is think of how about like as soon as you know, like if I if my knee hurt every day, but I just dealt with it, but then all of a sudden somebody told me my ACL was tore. Now my ACL's tore. It's an issue, right? So you can go back and forth, but maybe I can work through training if I didn't know it was wrong. That's his thought. So like maybe, maybe like somebody could say like you get an MRI and they say, oh man, Ty, you got to have surgery. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have to have surgery and you feel, you know, the argument could be if you didn't know this and you didn't have surgery and you made yourself worse, that would be terrible. But the other, the argument on the other side is uh, if you're not going to do anything about it, why worry about it, right? Like maybe you can just work through it. I, I don't know what the right answer is. I know, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. For me, no, I mean, that's the exact, the exact approach that I've taken for 10 years now. So, <laughs> no, you're 100% correct on that. Yeah. For me, I, I always play it off as like, if I go in, they're going to tell me that there's nothing wrong with me and I'm just a pussy. <laughs> that's, well, that's true too. Like, right. I've been worried on that side, you know, man. Like, because I, because, you know, secretly as an MRI tech, I make fun of people. Like if you came in and your back's hurting and I do an MRI and there's nothing wrong with you in my mind, I'm like, that guy needs to quit whining. But the thing is, sometimes, especially with the back, there's underlying issues that you can't quite see. And that happens. That's why a lot of people claim back pain on stuff because you can't prove or disprove it. There's, there's things that happen that you don't know. Like somebody, like, for example, I have little old ladies come in, backs wrecked, herniated discs everywhere, compression fractures everywhere. They're just walking. They act like they're in no no pain. I said, man, don't your your back's horrible. It doesn't hurt. Said, oh, it hurts a little bit. I just I just get through it. And then I'll have a guy in that has no noticeable problem, and he's literally screaming, literally crying, saying he needs help off the bed. He needs pain medicine. You know, I'm like, screw this guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> but that all being said, when I hurt my back, it was pretty similar. That's why I now have like a different appreciation because when you looked at my herniated disc. It wasn't as bad as some of the ones I saw. <coughs> so I could argue that I would be the same guy saying that guy needs to suck it up. But I know how much pain I was. And I feel like I'm pretty good at handling pain as many injuries that I had. Um, but I couldn't function for almost two years. And I was screwed. So <coughs> anyway, that being said, it's interesting. That's, that's what I'm not telling you what to do or not to do. But I wouldn't argue with somebody that did or did not check some out. You just know you're hurt, right? Yeah, this, this actually kind of leads into a question I got somebody asking online and uh, it's it's what are some of our thoughts as far as like avoiding injuries, dealing with injuries, 
while still trying to maintain a level of intensity that we're used to. Um, and that could be also for younger guys as well. Um, for me, uh, right now, I just try and roll safe. And by rolling safe, I roll hard, but like I'm not doing any explosive movements. I, I just kind of like, I will do cardiovascular movements. Uh, so it, it's, I know it's that like sometimes I don't ever do cartwheel passes in a competition, but if, if it looks safe to do a cartwheel pass on one of my guys, then I'll do that because I know I can safely do it and I'm getting exercise out of it, if that makes sense. So I can still keep my intensity level high. When I roll with my bigger guys or my higher belts, uh, rather than doing any of the, the like the, I don't want to say showboaty, but more athletic stuff, I, I keep that to a minimum and I slow the game down and I make it, I try and make it more methodical. So with my, with my, uh, with my less experienced guys, after I know I've kind of cooked them a little bit, I will do a lot more motion, a lot more guard passing, a lot more uh, dancing, kind of like the, the uh, faster foot passes, you know, stepping around, where with my bigger guys or my guys who are more experienced and I can't do that with as well, then it's just more methodical game. Good point. What about you, Ty? Anything you do that's... For me, um, for the guys in the 20s, if you're in your 20s, uh, the easiest easiest way to put it is don't be stupid and listen to your body because I was stupid. So when I initially hurt my back, it was really bad, but I didn't care and I kept training. And I, I made it so bad to where I couldn't get out of bed, sitting hurt, you know, and it took a long time to heal. So, but now, uh, depending on the day, my back will hurt. It, it's random. Like I'll wake up Monday and it's like, I don't have a problem. And then I'll wake up Tuesday and it's like, I, I, I've had the injury forever. So it's, it's a hit and miss with me. But when it comes to training, if I'm injured, um, I'll, if I can, I'll drill. I won't do any live rolls because doing any of the live rolls, it doesn't matter what it is and who you have. There's always some weird, awkward movements going to hurt you or somebody's going to try to pass and accidentally sprawl on your knee or something weird. And I mean, of course, mostly, most of the time it happens with white belts or people that are new because they have the awkward movement. They don't have those learned reactions that all of us in the deeper belts have learned. You know, just like when somebody gets side control on you, you turn in. That's your learned reaction as a, as a black and a brown belt. You know, when you're a white belt or a blue belt, your, your natural reaction is to turn out. You know, so you, you don't expect certain things from lower belts, but you also don't know what to expect from new people because new people just go nuts. And they do like the most drastic and erratic movements and that's what hurts you so for the most part if i'm injured i won't roll with new people i will only drill with higher belts and people that i trust and drilling is just as good because you can create a role or a segment of a role with just drilling so you're not losing any skill you can still go fast you can still get your cardio you can still get your timing you, you can still get your workout correctly in there so i mean it, it's kind of said too much but training smart is the key to it if you're not training smart, especially with an injury, you're just going to get more injured. And then you're just going to have to take more time off. And to some people, it's not worth it. I mean, depending who you are, you know, yeah. but for the most part, when it, when it comes down to it, don't, don't hurt things more than they should. And if it's an actual real injury, like how I have like a back injury, just sit, don't do anything. Maybe you can get on a stationary bike, but other than that, don't do anything crazy. I mean, you can mentally train as well. You can sit there and watch and you can watch how certain people do certain things. You can write things down. And as boring as that is, you're still learning and you're still moving forward. So it's not something to look past. It's something that you can use as a tool as well. I would, yeah, and I would also say like as a newer person, <clears throat> I would recommend not just not going to the gym because what I've found, those people have a harder time coming back. Does that make sense? Like, so like if you're, and the reason I say new, like starting out people is because, um, well, for one, no matter what happens to me, I run the gym. So I'm going to be there. It doesn't matter. You know, if I had surgery, I'm going to be sitting in a chair, teaching class. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm connected to the gym. I'm not losing that connection. However, I've seen so many people have, uh, let's say an ACL surgery. That's a pretty long surgery, meaning you're going to be out for a few months. They come, so they're gone. So they have a hard time coming back, right? Because they were gone for those couple months. Let's say they did come back. Now all of a sudden they haven't done anything for those several months. 
and they're losing to people that are quote unquote not as good as them. And it's really tough for their ego to handle. Um, so most of the time what I've seen is those, most of the people do stick around for a little while, but if it doesn't improve really fast, they find an excuse to disappear again. And then sometimes they don't come back. I've seen it, you know, I've had, I've, again, I've had a gym since 2000, so for over 20 years, seen it time and time again. And so what I try to tell people is this, like, what, exactly what you just said is try to go, right? Like, I'm not trying to tell you to, to work through your injury. Like, for example, like, Hoist Gracie told me, like, he's like, if you break your right ankle, that's okay. Then just play, you know, guard with your left ankle. You'll learn to be better on the other side. You know, don't stop. It's great advice because it is true to a certain degree because you can work through a couple of things and do that. Um, but it's not true with everything, right? Like when I uh, tore my bicep, you know, like I, I couldn't, I'd had a big metal brace on my arm. I, I couldn't, there's nothing I could do without hurting somebody else running into that. So I can't, so not, it, it doesn't work for everything, right? But if you can still go and take notes or, you know, do the things that you can do by drilling, great options. The most important thing is like, we're all creatures of habit. So if we get out of habit, we start something else, which means not coming to the gym and doing something else and eating bad and being lazy. That's essentially what you're going to go to. And then when it becomes difficult again, you're not going to, you're not going to break embrace the grind because you're already in the habit of not going. And so now it sucks. And you're like, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? That's why I think a lot of, you know, the, the blue belt curse people hear of, I think that's what happens. What I've noticed a lot of times is, is the, it's not that people quit when they're blue belt because they just quit. It's like they become a blue belt. Then they, they run into those things that we're talking about, whether it's time, work, a relationship, things that take them away from the gym. So now they're not able to beat all the white belts like they were. And then that bruises their ego because now they're like, well, I should beat that guy. I'm a blue belt. And, and then they can't take the hits to their, to their ego. And then that's what makes them quit right like it's i think most of the time people still love jujitsu it's just the fact that they hit this milestone and they can't they can't understand why they can't beat certain people anymore and they're not willing to put in the effort and to, to rebuild themselves right i and i totally get it because in a weird way that's what i'm saying like i'm not saying like i'm at that point right now but i'm in a slump to where i'm, I'm getting hurt so much i'm getting this and that and it's like it's depressing in a way like again i'm part of the gym i'm going to be there all the time but it's like I don't have that same enthusiasm. My ego takes a beating a little bit too, because I'm like, man, it's like, I used to be able to do this or do that. And it's like, it's not smooth anymore. It's kind of annoying, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, I have those thoughts swimming in my head. The difference is I own the gym, so I'm there. I'm going to work through it. Those people don't have that connection where they have to go. It's easier for them to say like, hey man, I will uh, sit one out today. Then I'm gonna sit out tomorrow and I'm gonna sit out the next day, right? And then it's just a perpetual thing that just keeps going. Um, it's difficult. It's very difficult, right? Like, and I, and look, I don't have the right answer for everybody. I just, what I just said is, is I think do whatever you can when you have an injury to be in the gym and, and stay in that environment because habits are easy to break or ab habits are easy to lose, right? Discipline is not for everybody. Um, and, and, you know, and then again, if you're not at the gym, you're going to get into something else. And then that thing becomes part of your life. And then, you know, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. So I think you're right, Todd, too, is this, my suggestion would be what you said is just be there. I'm not going to tell people to work out, work through the injuries, because sometimes that's not all, always realistic, but you should be there. Stay in that community as, as much as you can and try not to lose that habit. Um, because then you might never get it back, right? It's, it's just a weird thing. All humans are, are like that. I just think we all are, you know. Um, what's your thoughts, Gary? You think the same or, or similar? Yeah, it's definitely, I think, uh, it definitely habits. Uh, they're, easy to, they're easy to break. They're hard to make. And, and I, that's with anything. Um, after, you, after you start doing something, like, well, jujitsu is my habit, right? Uh, I go every day and I'm there every day. When I don't have it, I uh, initially I get a little upset and I, I'm usually a little testy, like at the beginning of COVID. Yeah. And then it got to the point where it's like, well, I guess I'll just sit around and drink some more bourbon and eat some more cheeseburgers. So, yeah. so yeah. It, it's, 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 and that it's, that's the easy thing to do. And for whatever reason, regardless for me of, of what, what it is, like, I like the easy thing because it's easy. Even my jujitsu game, I keep kind of simple. And so I do the easy thing a lot of times. And, uh, and I, that's my, my habit. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So, um, 
you know, barring that question, so let's talk about the next thing. So competing when we're older, so training, I still don't think that I have the answers I was looking for. <laughs> so I don't think we're gonna answer that. <laughs> like, what, Cause I, you know, again, I'm one of those guys struggling through the same thing that people are asking us. Um, but on competition wise, what is, so here's what I'm thinking. So time we've, we've, you know, I guess we all agree is the biggest thing for all of us, right? So that's gonna be the same for competing wise. Um, Gary already kind of mentioned, he's already talked to his family. So that, that's a good point is that you probably need to have this conversation before outside um, things become an issue. Like if Gary just started doing it without, you know, asking, I guess it's not really the right, you know, I mean, it's, it's but you got to remember like a marriage is a partnership. If, if your wife or your husband doesn't show up and, and they're not mind readers, right? So if Gary just started, was like, Hey, like she should support me because this is what I want to do. And I'm not selling drugs. I'm not working out. Cause that's usually what I hear from people in the gym when they, their wives get mad at them. They're like, I could be out doing drugs. I'm here working out. Why is she so mad? It's just the fact that you don't have the conversation. You just have to have the conversation saying, Hey, like I'm going to put a little extra time in the gym. Here's why this is important to me. Then of course your, your person's going to support you. Nobody would, right? Like there may be some bumpy roads along the way, but if you frame it in such a way that you're going to get support, then I think that's the way to go. Right. So I guess the point would be that Gary's going to have to take, you know, or anybody um, you're going to have to, take away from something right so that's family time relationship time gym time the other thing too that i noticed like one of the things i told people too is like back thing a guy was still boxing and kickboxing do you know trying to do mma jiu-jitsu all this stuff when i started a gym and my thought process early on was the more time i spent on myself the less time i spent on the guys that are paying me to come to the gym so i, I had a kind of a problem with that because I, it, again i just get real obsessive so it was all about me and it was like you know if somebody new came in i didn't really give a crap because i didn't have time to deal with them i had to get ready for my stuff right so things went down it's because of my personality so i'm not saying what i did was right for everybody but ultimately i had to make the decision i was like what because i'm so obsessive and, and I'm, i get hung up on those stuff like i'm i'm gonna have to step away and give my full time to all these other people and try to make them better because that's what they're paying me to do that's what they're here for it makes the most sense um but in general i do think like i said if you can't do that what are you going to give up we're going to have to give up something and some people can't do that so that's going to be the biggest thing on the on the competition thing i think if if i'm on the right track is probably having this competition and or having that conversation and trying to figure out what you're going to give up. What's the trade-off. So what are we going to give away for, for, for the fact that you want to compete and maybe quite frankly, you could just say, Hey man, why don't you just give me 2021 after 2021, we'll, we'll reevaluate the thing. Give, give me a year. So let's see what happens. Right. Maybe that's the best way for us to go to tackle that thing. Like you can tell your people at the gym, your students, everything. Hey, you know, I'm going to do a little bit more stuff for me. I hope you guys are all cool with that. But I think even that you should have a conversation with the guys at your gym. So they know maybe why you're giving them less time because, because it's important to me and we're all going to get better because I'm going to get better and we'll all share in this or something. Right. Uh, what do you guys and that's, about? that's, that's something that I've talked to the guys about too. <laughs> like if, if this is something that I'm going to do, if I would really want to like try and make a push for it, like, don't be surprised if, I'm a little more greedy if I'm missing a little bit, if I happen to go down to Butch's or make my way over to Apex and train with those guys, maybe go back up to Columbus, train with some new people, get new bodies. Um, they have to kind of expect that as well. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm because I've entered into a partnership with all my students too, you know, and I, it's, it, yes, it's my gym, but we're all there to learn. And so I am, a, I, uh, it's across the board. It's across the board as far as like the the sacrifices we're all making. What's a good point? So obviously, so Ty, you got to take off and uh, it's your son's birthday. Yeah, it, it's my son's birthday today. It's a uh, birthday cake time, so I have to slip out. All right, well, that's good, man. I appreciate the time and happy birthday to your son and I uh, hope you guys have a good time. Me and Gary finished this up. It won't wait much longer, but it was good to, to hang out with you for a little while. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate you guys. All right, man. See, you. see ya. Take it easy. All right. So down to two, but no, so I, 
honestly, I, I think if I was going to give advice, like what we're saying that right now, Gary, is important. I think we've learned this as as getting old, as we got older, right? Is is communication. I mean, how many times you hear that from women uh, about communication, right? And most guys like, right? But it, it doesn't mean exactly what we think it means. Um, it just means like you have to have a conversation. Like if it's important to you, everybody's going to understand. You just you guys just have to share the things that are going, what's going on through your mind, because I think what people think is including your gym and beside your wife or girlfriend, right? Is that you assume everybody's in with you, right? And they know what you know, or they know what you're thinking, or you might like, you might've told half the gym. And so you think the whole gym knows, right? It's the same thing. You just need to communicate so that what I've learned through my whole life is that <clears throat> people's feelings get hurt and it's stupid. Sometimes, you know, I want to attack them because I'm like, that's stupid. Why do you think that way? Really, it only took just a simple conversation to say, hey, well, here's what, what I was thinking. I wasn't trying to hurt your feelings. Or I'm not trying to take away from you. How can we work together? That's it. Then I don't have to deal with like a month of us being like hard feelings over everybody. You know, what I mean, it's like and that's a hard thing to learn because you, you also like I don't want to do that. Right. I, I don't. I, I want people to like if it's important to me, I want people to understand it's important to me. But that's not reality. It's just we're all different. Like we're not mind readers. Right. And like we come up sometimes people come up with stories in their head that aren't true. Like if somebody does something, you think it's all against you and then you start creating a story in your head and it's none of it's true. And so if you can break that out from the get go and address things, and if somebody's if it's bothering somebody, even at the gym, say, hey, man, like I come every day and I pay all this money and I don't feel like you're taking, you know, give me attention. You could be like, well, what can I do to give you some more attention? Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. And then sometimes you can't come up with an answer. That's OK, too. But then there's no hard feelings because you can you can calmly say, hey, like, here's what I could do right now. I understand where you're coming from. You have every right that you want to train. You want to do better. Um, if I can't provide that for you right now, there's no hard feelings. You're still my friend. You know, it's not the best to me. Of course, you all have egos. You're going to be a little hurt. Um, but realistically, you need to look back in the mirror and just say, hey, like, you know, this it is what it is. And hopefully we can rectify that. Right. I, it's my yeah. problem. Yeah, well, and I know, I, I and I'm guilty of this, um, a lot of times, and maybe it's like attention deficit disorder that I have or something, I don't know, I, I've just not been diagnosed, but like, sometimes it seems so obvious in my head that what I'm doing is, it should just be like, it should, like everybody knows this, I don't have to explain it, yeah. you know, and because of that, I'll just run with it. And I don't talk to anybody about it and I don't say anything about it. And then I've, I get halfway into it and nobody knows what I'm doing because I thought it was obvious and it wasn't. Yeah. Perfect. No, and that's everybody. So it's not you or being attentive. It's everybody. That's the most fights in a relationship are the same exact way, right? It's the same, literally. And, and the reason I'm not acting like I'm an expert on all this stuff, but as part of my job, I've had to take all this leadership training and, and all this stuff. And so I've went through classes on this exact same thing and, and knowing that that's the main difference, right? Like they had a prime example that I don't want to get too back off topic, but on one of these leadership classes I had, it was, uh, it was about a husband and wife, but they were just talking about how things can get blown out of portion without having all the information, which is literally what we're talking about, right? Like somebody doesn't have all the information you think they do. So you do this, they get mad at you. And then you're mad at them because you think they understand what you're saying. You know I mean? It's like, then all of a sudden it's just this fight and then you're fighting over everything because you're mad at each other. Right. And anyway, like the, the example was, um, you know, his husband and wife, they get this bill at home. The bill, it, it, it has a hotel charge on it. Right. The wife gets it, it's hotel charge. So she immediately in her head thinks, Oh, he's cheating on me. That son of a bitch did this. And it's just, it's growing. She's creating a story in her head. Which, which is pretty common for most people, but especially for females, as this book says. So it's not for me, but they're saying it's, they, they a lot of times make, it's, they're more emotional. So they make a bigger story up, right? So she's, by the time he gets home from work, she's ready to explode. So she says, what's this charge about? Before he can even say, she's just like, you son of a bitch, you're cheating on me. You know, it's blah, blah, blah. And then it's just building and they're fighting. So when, if you can get the facts out, was the rest of the story was, it was actually a charge from the two of them. They went to a dinner, you know, the husband and wife had went to a dinner that hadn't to be attached to the hotel. Instead of saying, you know, we had dinner at Longhorn Steakhouse, it came up as a hotel charge, you know, blah, blah, blah. So like really in the end of the story was, <clears throat> he wasn't cheating. They had made the charge together. The facts were the facts. 
However, because she didn't have the facts, she made up a story. And so the ultimate story was one, don't make up stories until you have the facts, right? Like, and then the other, you know, it was to communicate, get all these things through. Um, but the point was, and the, and the reason I made this is a bigger example is we all do that, right? Meaning that just like you said, you'll say, well, I need to train because I have to get ready for this tournament. I've got to do this. So I'm going to be at the house less. I'm going to do this. All this makes perfect sense to me. Um, and you already said to your wife, hey, I'm, I'm going to compete. So in her mind, she thinks you're going to compete, but she doesn't know that you need to spend more time away from the house, that you're not going to be there, that you're doing this, you're doing that. And so all of a sudden, maybe she's saying, well, he's not here. He doesn't love me no more. He doesn't, you know what I mean? And then you start fighting and stuff. So I mean, the bottom line really is what we just said is the communication probably we, we could avoid most of those problems from the get go if you just have it said. And then ultimately those things are going to arrive again, probably, but you just need both parties need to, to get to the facts and, it, and both parties are, are guilty, right? I shouldn't come after you without having all the facts. I should come to you and say, hey, like, why haven't you been home? Like, what, I know you're training for this tournament, but like, what, what's going on or something like that, right? And so we both have to do that. Um, but most people don't go through a leadership training thing like I did, right? So they, they don't. And so like my wife's not going to think that. I've even actually brought this stuff up to her and she, she acts like I'm talking down to her or mansplaining to her <laughs> so she doesn't listen, right? So it actually doesn't help. But I try to be cognizant of it and just nip things in the bud. And I've also noticed at the gym, like when people have been mad about certain things, it's because of lack of communication. Like somebody, like maybe I change a class and then that instructor gets mad, I think, well, he's trying to run me out of the gym. He doesn't care about me. My class must suck. And it was like zero to do with anything. It just was more convenient. I didn't have the conversation up front. And so then instead of, even though like I'm mad at that person for running with this thing, I take responsibility because I say, I should have came to you first. I didn't, it would have, it would have, you know, avoided all this situation and all this conflict. So um, that's what I've learned through this, through my work is just literally just say, those things like when you're getting older uh, you know to get back on track and we're trying to compete there's going to be a lot of people involved in this situation as compared to when we're 18 when i was 18 nobody was involved in that situation except for me it didn't matter if my girlfriend either to be honest with you because that's my girlfriend i'm 18 you're probably not getting married to that girl either right so it's different you can make decisions on your own unilaterally and deal with consequences you you, you may not even be on your own by that point you may be with your parents you may be this or that as 40 year old men with kids and families and responsibilities and even work, all these things, work may suffer because you're spending more time at the gym. I'm not saying you have to go to your job and tell them what you're doing. You just need to understand that it may suffer and you may get yelled at and you're gonna have to have some conversations with some people saying, look, I'm sorry, I'll try to do better, but here's why. And also don't expect them to give a shit, right? If it's your job, like you're still paid to do something they don't give a shit if you're competing or not right yeah absolutely and and to to come back to the the sacrifices made like i think it's important just in general also to be understanding right yeah. so on the opposite side of it not not just make sure that everybody knows all the as much information as possible but know that everybody else is going to make those same mistakes. So when it, when it's my turn to like make up the story about the hotel charge, yeah, I need to like, let's wait until I get all the information. Yeah. Well, quite frankly, that's something you learn with age, right? Uh, yeah. The same conversation. If you try to have this when I was 18 or 20, I would just I already thought I knew it all. And I'd be like, whatever, that's what old people do. I do something different and it works for me. I mean, I literally everything I was told, I mean, any mistakes I've made from not listening to people, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I'm one of those people that need to make a mistake and learn from a mistake. You know, somebody gives me the right thing. Um, I had, you know, <clears throat> even with the gyms wise, I, you know, I opened a gym early 2000s and I had a dozen probably fail for different reasons, but most of them were like simple. I just didn't listen. You know, I had, I had smart people, Hoist Gracie, Marcelo Monteiro, people that ran dozens and hundreds, actually hundreds of affiliates and gyms and tell me exactly what to do. And I thought I could reinvent the wheel on my own and, and do my own thing and uh, ultimately failed every time. But eventually I figured out instead of blaming everything else, which you also do when you're young, say, well, I, this, the gym failed because everybody else didn't pay rent or everybody else, you know, then I was like, okay, what? Like, 
like, how can I fix it? It all lays back on my shoulders, right? If it's set up right from the get-go and it's correctly from the get-go, then it'll probably succeed. Um, so anyway, but those are things I think you learn more. So I, look, I, and that's kind of the point of this. I think we're trying to give advice. I'm not not guessing that, or I'm not assuming that everybody's going to listen to it because um, that's what I'm saying. They're not, but maybe if it's out there and after you fail a few times, maybe it'll ring true to you and uh, it'll help uh, uh, get a little bit. And like I said, like, to be honest, I'm still sorting through my own thing. And uh, so is one of my friends that, should have been on this podcast with us right he said he's in a little bit of a slump right now and and i think this is pretty common for guys our age and i'm not saying that we have the right answers right because it's hard to um come to grips with the fact that you're not what you were right um and gary you might not be hitting that stage yet but i'm i'm definitely hitting that stage where you know i'm not invincible or not you know not a superstar of whatever i thought i was um but it's hard it's an ego it's an ego bummer you know i mean and, and i'm still working like i said i'm still working through it um i've come into the point right like i'm just not training as much as was or what as i was because uh i don't want to get hurt and also just like, i'm head over heels in my job right now and that's the reality of life you know so i have to i'm working through my problem right now is just working out balance in my head so even though we're giving everybody this this advice i still don't have all the answers because i don't have the answer to my own life you know right? and uh it's probably going to change a bunch of times. Even after I get the answer, it'll probably change again. Um, but the other part of this is just to make everybody know that they're not alone, right? And these things that we're thinking about is, hey, we all go through this. And I think that's important too, um, because we all think we're unique individuals. We got our own problems that nobody else has. And it turns out that almost everybody goes through very similar things, right? And then talking through these things really kind of helps us um, sometimes figure out your own problems, just talking. I mean, literally that's when you go to a psychiatrist, psychologist, all those, you're almost always telling yourself what to do. They just say, yeah, uh-huh, now tell me more. And then you're like, wait, maybe that's my problem, you're right? Like you're just kind of figuring it out. And that's, you know, it's one of the things I'm using here is, is uh, to talk through some of the issues we have, see if it helps me, see if I can help somebody else and then kind of go from there. Yeah. Uh I, I, I agree completely. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want, man, uh, I don't know if we can crush anything else on this topic. Do you got any other questions out there that anybody asked you? Uh, I just had the one question shot to me. Um, other than that, I think it'd probably be a good time to throw out there that we've got a competition in Athens County. It's going to be at Nelsonville on June 26th. So uh, it's going to be a submission only. Hopefully we can get as many people out there. Um, there's a couple schools in our area. It'd be nice to get as many people out there as possible, raise, raise, uh, you know, raise as much interest in jujitsu and, uh, in the area as we can and, and, uh, get some good competition and see yeah. what's going on. And that's a good point. And, and on to that point, guys, that's why, you know, I started these tournaments in early 2000s, but that's literally why, you know, cause I, I'm not trying to be a big tournament. Like I think that a lot of times we run it and it's, it's very, it's, it's just as good as any big tournament. But what I am trying to do is give as many matches to people as they want, right? Sometimes they don't want all the matches I think they want. Sometimes that's fine and that's okay. The other thing is just like you said earlier, uh, Gary, you know, you go to IBJJF and you pay all this money and your travel fees and your food and your hotel and all this stuff and you're one and done and you go home. Um, I'm trying not to make that happen. We try to do at least double elimination at the very least, but I have a million divisions. People can come to me and ask me to put them in divisions and I'll put them in divisions. Um, a lot of times people will argue over, you know, who won or didn't win. And I'll just say, Hey, you guys want to go again? And then they can go again or they don't have to, but all these things would never happen in a big tournament. They would just take your money and tell you to go home. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not bashing those tournaments, but I am saying is you got an opportunity to go with, pretty much the same people that are in these big tournaments and at a lower price and a price that's going to get you a lot of fun and it's it's com competitor friendly um i know i've had some people that worry like especially because i have a gym that maybe we're uh maybe partial to our people that is complete bullshit just so you know like it's not true but not only is it not true just i want somebody to think through that for example I want, like, there is nobody that gets screwed more than my guys. And I'll tell you why. 
um, it's because I know they won't complain. So I put them in every single division. They could be outweighed by 40 pounds. They could be in like a division that has nothing to do with them. And they don't even know. I don't even ask them. I put them in every division. I never give them buys because I don't want people to think that I gave a buy to their own guy. So if it's, there's three people and somebody's going to get a buy, promise you, it doesn't go to our people. Um, they get, they get the short end of this. They don't get coached because I am teaching, you know I mean? I'm running the tournament. I mean, I can go on and on how it's so impartial to our people. And, and believe me, I've only heard this actually from one gym. So I'm, I'm not saying everybody, but I just also want to bring that up is just know there's no impartially. I want, I want people to come back. So just know that I'm going to bend over backwards for you from a different gym more so than any of our, uh, anybody that's my friend. Um, like Hoist Gracie said a long time ago, um, don't be my friend because you're my friend. You're going to have a lot harder road. He said that had to do with belts. He, you know, he said, if you think being my friend is going to get you a blue belt, think again, my friend, being my friend is going to get you a blue belt in four or five years because I don't want nobody to think that I gave it to you because you're my friend. Same thing in a tournament. So I just say that to be just because I've never actually addressed that before. I say that to be rest assured that uh, this is as fun, as cool as I can do. Um, there's some mistakes. We have some refs that uh, they do as best they can, but all refs make up. And believe me, it's not because they want to mess up or mess, or mess your up, mess your game up. Uh, we'll rectify that situation if we can. But also, that's why you pay a cheap price. I'm not paying a billion dollars for these top caliber people to come in. We have great refs. Um, but the reason the price is lower is because, um, you know, sometimes we have purple and brown belt refs, right? We're not paying black belts from all across the world to come in. Um, I know that's better, but then now you'd be paying $100 and $150 a compete instead of 60 bucks, you know. Um, so anyway, I think that this this tournament's great for, for a small local thing to give you plenty of, of competition, get you ready for those bigger tournaments. Um, and all those things are still great. We're not trying to be them. Those people are awesome. And I appreciate them as much as everybody else. So uh, hopefully everybody will come out and just have some fun. Yeah, also, that refing really shouldn't matter too much in this one because it's submission only. So get, get it done yourself. There is no, there is no ifs, ands, buts, advantages, any of that stuff. It's, you got, you got a time to get things done and do it yourself. And, and arguably you can say that's the truest form of competition. Not everybody's designed for that. I get it. Right. But I think when this was all started, Alio Gracie probably envisioned a submission only type format. I know he did because I talked to them, but he was, he, he, he envisioned, I mean, you guys know how they did MMA matches that went hours and hours, right? So, I mean, that, that's kind of what they did. So, submission only. I think it's fun. I think it'd be awesome. Um, and just like you said, Gary, hopefully we're bringing something to an area that's not really been served before. That's also why we do a lot of stuff in West Virginia. Everybody ignores West Virginia. Everybody probably ignores Nelsonville, Ohio. So, here we come to, to try to give somebody something special. So, hopefully they see it as such and... Uh, Everybody has a good time. Well, Butch, it's good talking to you, man. And uh, I'll see you soon. All right, buddy. I appreciate All right. it. All right. Thank you, brother.